Well, okay, we are in the book of 1 Kings, starting a new book. Not really, it's a continuation of the previous one. I might mention, so while, I, while it's fresh in my mind, in the Septuagint, they call 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th kingdoms. Sometimes, because of Jerome, sometimes translated. In some Bibles have 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th kings for 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. The book is divided because the scrolls are too big to handle. It's not divided by content, particularly. It's, 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 so 1st and 2nd Kings are divided so they're roughly the same size, believe it or not. I was quite intrigued to discover that. And uh, so let's take a look at where we are. As we look at the panorama of history from the creation through, the say, the restoration of Israel in recent years, uh, there's certain, certain periods. And of course, uh, we're going to explore this particular segment, what I'll call the monarchy, essentially from Saul uh, to the exile, from Babylon captivity. Samuel, of course, set up, he's the, end of, he's the end of the judges. He's the bridge from the judges to the kings. And we have Saul, Saul, David, Solomon. And then after Solomon dies, there'll be a, a civil war and the, the kingdom splits into two groups, two parts. The southern kingdom of Judah will survive to the Babylonian exile, but the northern kingdom of Israel goes from bad to worse and gets wiped out by the Assyrians. And we'll deal with that when we get there. But uh, 1 Samuel takes us up to the end of Saul. 2 Samuel gives us the life of David. One of the useful things to remember, if you can keep it in your mind, think, when you think of 2 Samuel, think of David. 1 Samuel is obviously up to Saul, Samuel and Saul, and then David is, is contained, in a sense, pretty much, in 2 Samuel. But uh, at the end of David's life, the beginning of Solomon, we have 1 Kings. 1 and 2 Kings will take us all the way through to the Babylonian exile. But the break between 1 Kings and 2 Kings isn't really by some topical breakdown, it's by the size of the scroll, uh, interestingly enough. And obviously in 1 Kings, the book that we're entering now, we'll talk about Solomon and a good, a good portion of the north and southern kingdom. So, in fact, we'll get to the, 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 one of the break points between 1 and 2 Kings turns out to be between Elijah and Elisha, if you will. So if you think of from Solomon through Elijah, you're sort of, you've got the, the, the boundary conditions of 1 Kings. Later on, uh, we'll go through 1 and 2 Chronicles, which is in a sense a repeat. 1 Chronicles parallels 2 Samuel. And 2 Chronicles parallels 1 uh, and 2 Kings with a particular emphasis on the southern kingdom, on Judah and particularly the priestly functions. So that may be helpful in just giving you a broad perspective. And of course, we're going to deal with the rise and fall of the monarchy. 1 and 2 Samuel went through Samuel, Saul, and David, of course. 1 and 2 Kings, we'll talk about David's 40-year reign. It will conclude. And then Solomon, then the divided kingdom. There'll be a civil war and we'll deal with those until finally the, the exiles of both the north and southern kingdom. The first and second chronicles, which we will review when we get there, is will it be a recap pretty much of the southern kingdom. So that's a quick rundown. Now we've just finished uh, Second Samuel. We'll talk about David, who was an incredible human being. One of the uh, perhaps personal frustrations of, of, of the pace at which we're going, we could have done well to probably stop and really spend time understanding the person of David. Incredible human being, a, a clever general, a very military guy. And uh, at the same time, he's also a poet and what have you. And he, of course, subdued the Philistines, Syrians, Ammonites, Edomites, in other words, to the west, north, east, and south. Uh, he was also quite an administrator. He organized the priesthood into 24 courses, which is important to understand when you get to the book of Revelation. While he's doing all this as really an administrator, general, what have you, he found time to write songs. He was a poet. And of course, the Psalms are exemplify some of his work. Not the only work, there's other work too. But of course, then we saw the turning point at his peak this great sin, which is a demonstration of the honesty in Scripture, which we see all through the Scripture, how it, it doesn't hide the blemishes. Uh, the sin of not just adultery, but then murder. And uh, that was not just an incident. It was the culmination of a process of, of prosperous ease and self-indulgence and so on. But the good news is one reason God can speak of David as a man after his own heart because of his remorse and repentance is exemplified by Psalm 51. And that's why in the Scripture he is called a man after God's own heart because God honors and repentance. That's one of our biggest challenges in our personal lives, is to be sensitive to and repent of the blemishes that we find them, and there are many. And of course, then we talk about the years of suffering. No matter how much he, 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 he remorse and contrition, it couldn't obliterate the consequences of incest, fratricide, intrigues, rebellion, and ultimately civil war. One of the penalties also, he was not allowed to build the temple. We're going to deal with that because Solomon is the guy that's credited with building a temple. What we overlook is the fact that David paid all the bills in advance. <laughs> He couldn't build a temple, but he could prepay the expenses. So, uh, and of course, there were troubles in the family. You remember in 2 Samuel 12, there was the prophecy by Nathan, the sword will never depart from thine house. And uh, we saw that the first son by Bathsheba died. 
And then he lost moral authority with Ammon raped uh, David's daughter Tamar. Absalom then kills Amnon. Absalom goes on to lead a rebellion against David. And counseled by Bathsheba's grandfather, who obviously never forgave David for what he did. And then another incident where Adonijah will seize the kingdom. We'll see that coming up here and so forth. So anyway, we're in 1 Kings and we'll carry it you know, halfway through this divided kingdom. So the first 11 chapters will focus on the 40 years of King Solomon, his accession to the throne and how he cleans up the mess, some of the mess of David's dirty linen, if you will. How the temple will be built and it'll take us to the peak of the glory of the nation Israel throughout all history and set up until the millennium, of course. And then it's decrease as Solomon tragically has starts. He starts great, but he blows it later. And boy, finishing well is the challenge for each of us. Finishing and Solomon's our example. But that leads to a civil war, the divided kingdom, which will cover will cover about 80 years from chapters 12 through 22, which uh, where Rehoboam accedes to Solomon's throne when Solomon dies, but uh, Jeroboam rebels, takes off the northern kingdom in a uh, in a splinter group, if you will. And the term Judah, the, not just the tribe of Judah, but the southern kingdom is called Judah. And the northern kingdom collectively is called Israel. One of the things that we're going to emphasize when we get there is to discover that all 12 tribes are involved in both kingdoms because the faithful in the north migrate to the south, independent of what tribe they're from. And likewise, the idol the ones that lean towards idol worship in the south would go where it was politically correct, up north. And that's all described in, in 1 Chronicles 11. We'll get into that when the time comes, and so forth. So, Now, Solomon acceded uh, to his throne, by the way, when he's about 15 years old, according to Josephus. We, we fa fail to realize how young some of these people are. So Adonijah was tempted to preempt, but was thwarted by Nathan, because he was perceptive enough to realize what was going on here, and he nailed it early. We'll see that happen. And so David, on his deathbed, instructs Solomon to clean house of overdue punishments. And Joab is going to be nailed and, and Shimei and some other things. So, so let's just get into it here. First Kings chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Well, a couple of comments too. I might just... Uh, uh, chrono you should know, we're not going to get into it, but uh, chronology is a problem. There are all kinds of chronological problems if you really start getting into the depths of First Second Kings. Because part, and part of the reason is that there's often co-regency where two kings are not necessarily sequentially overlap, strangely enough. And also, Judah and Israel both use different methods to determine the years of a king's reign. And each nation switched their methods uh, during the period of history in First and Second Kings. So if you're going to get into this, you, end, you can't get into it a little bit. You, if you're going to get into the chronology subtleties, you've you got a challenge because it's... it's it's a, I must have a, a dozen books just focusing on the chronological problems in the books of, in books of Kings. The, the good news is there's no big deal. It's not as if there's some big issue. It's just that it's, it's, it's tricky to try to reconcile it all. But the major dates, to give you a background here, the kingdom gets divided about 931 B.C. The northern kingdom goes, gets wiped out by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And uh, the southern kingdom, called Judah, goes into captivity in about 586 B.C. and uh, comes out 70 years later, essentially, to oversimplify it. Now, something you also should know before we get into this is during the days of David, both Egypt and Assyria are very weak. They're not really dominant yet. The, uh, these impotent nations will rise to power during the period of First and Second Kings. Um, and I won't go into that background. We'll deal with that when we get there. But uh, that'll be important to understanding later on. Anyway, David, for 33 years, had aggressively uh, guided God's people to, uh, to greatness. David, you know, we, we so focus on the glory of Solomon. The truth of the matter is David really uh, forged a very powerful empire in that day. And Solomon would take it to its real peak, dominating that, that region. But see, as David gets older, his sons start disputing over succession. We're going to see some of that unfold here. But let's remember as we do this that God had already revealed that David would be succeeded by Solomon. So that was not an ambiguous thing as far as a biblical view. And, uh, so, and David had shared this revelation that Solomon would succeed with Bathsheba, which is Solomon's mother. And uh, 
He'd even announced it to the nation. We'll find that out when we get to First Chronicles 22, but uh, uh, to make it, where it makes it quite clear. And uh, Solomon, by the way, was not the oldest son. There are other older brothers who were understandably frustrated by this because they felt they had the right in front of this. And one of David's older sons, Adonijah, will try to take steps to gain the succession. But Bathsheba's a little naive, but Nathan sees what's coming, and he nails it right up front. We'll watch that unfold as we go. And uh, so Nathan insisted that David act, and he did. Here's, he's old, he's stricken, but he, he uh, doesn't hesitate. He does exactly what had to happen. So at verse 1, Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. The clothes are talking about are bed clothes, by the way. It's a, a translational issue, sort of. David, you realize, was a warrior. He had many, many years of misfortunes at the hands of Saul and uh, before he came to the throne, and so he reached the age of uh, 70 years, according to 2 Samuel 5. And his own writings, David's own writings, marked out 70 years of, as the nominal end of life. Three score and ten is the number, the nominal number. And it's interesting today, if you talk to your insurance agent, it's improved a little, but not a lot. You know, you find estimates from 68 to 72, depending on what some assumptions you go into the actuarial tables with. What might have been the final blow that weakened David was the uh, uh, Absalom's rebellion back in the Second Samuel 15 and following, as you recall. Now he's they put covers over him, and he still he still got chills that a virgin would be sought to um, minister to him, who was vigorous and free from domestic responsibilities, was a practice that was not unusual. So verse 2, Wherefore a servant said unto him, let, be, let it be sought for my lord the king, a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, that my lord the king may get heat. Now it sounds like this is uh, an immoral thing. Uh, it'll, the text will make it clear that, that we're not talking about him taking her in that sense. If I could be a little flippant, probably, this is the, the best answer they had for it instead of electric blanket. But anyway... Um, <laughs> So, so they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. In other words, they're, they're trying to make it clear this was not a, a sexual thing. It was like a, a, an intimate nurse that took care of him. But Abishag is very fair. Let me tell you how fair she is. She's the one, I believe, that the Song of Songs by Solomon is all about. And we're going to we'll hear more about here in a little bit. But at this point, I think it's fair to take it face value here that uh, she uh, is there as a, a you know a, a private nurse. And uh, Josephus and Galen, two writers in the uh, first century and second century, refer to this therapeutic practice, uh, which continued even into the Middle Ages. So it sounds strange to us, and we like to think the worst, but that's really. <laughs> Uh, what it's all about, I mean, in terms of what this text says. And so we're not talking about intimate relations here. We're talking about a nurse. I think she is identified by name here because she's going to figure prominently in some episodes that follow. So then we get to verse 5. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. This sounds like he's obviously got an ego problem. And uh, he's starting to put himself forward publicly, uh, saying, I will be king. That's a key phrase. Adonijah was David's fourth son, 1 2 Samuel 3. And he might have probably was the oldest of the sons living at that time. He's almost not the oldest. And uh, he probably believed that he had a right to the throne. But he, he's ignoring the theological implications of God having already chosen Solomon, who is the, the first surviving son of Bathsheba. And I want you to be sensitive to that, that Solomon is the first surviving son of Bathsheba because Luke takes his genealogy, not through like Matthew does, through the first of the royal line, i.e. Solomon. Luke takes his genealogy through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan. Not Nathan the prophet, the son named Nathan. And, and the, so you need to understand the genealogy in Luke is a different one than Matthew. It's, it's of Mary, not Joseph. And that's a whole other study that I encourage you to get into. But... Uh, so anyway, Adonijah is doing some uh, public relations work here, and is and says, and and uh, verse six, and his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, "Why hast thou done so?" And he also was a very go a goodly man, and his br uh, mother bare him after Absalom. Uh, who is his father? David. Sure, get the uh, that's that's, that's <laughs> the point. And but he obviously is very spoiled and undisciplined. And I think this phrase that his father had not displeased him at any time is a Funny translation, if you will, the fact that David probably was not 
He did not excel as a father. He did many good things, great general, great poet, so but he obviously had problems with his sons. He obviously uh, apparently indulged them because here's a case where uh, it says, father had not displeased him at any time. That's a way of saying, I think that he's spoiled and undisciplined. That is that Nigel was. So, and apparently very goodly man. I mean, he's a good looking guy uh, and probably more for his appearance than his character, I suspect. But uh, evidently, Adonijah expected that his plot would succeed because he's popular and presumably uh, apparently capable, championing uh, uh, what he would consider a worthy cause. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah. There's that son of Zeruiah again. See, it's the son of a gal that Jesse married. So he's not really, he's, a, he's not really you know, uh, related to David except through marriage because of a prior son that Zariah had before she married Jesse. Remember, and it's always interesting, these guys, there's a group of them, three of them, that are always mentioned as the son of Zariah, which is in Hebrew text strange because it's usually always the man that he's the son of. You know, it's the woman because they're making a point that, that uh, Jesse was like a stepfather, so to speak. And conferred with Joab and uh, Biathar the priest, and they, uh, and they following Adonijah helped him. Joab, uh, again, was David's nephew, um, son of a half-sister. He uh, served David very faith for many years while he, through the whole issue of Saul and all that when David was being pursued. Uh, Joab was uh, commander-in-chief of, of David's army, and he proved himself a very shrewd military strategist, valiant, uh, uh, but he was not above cruelty and actual treachery in certain instances. And uh, his chief military conference was the capturing of Jerusalem and the siege of Rabbah of the Ammonites, and I'll go through his whole history here. But he was very brutal, and we're going to see that come, to, come home to roost before we're all through. He murdered three important men. Abner, that was Saul's commander-in-chief. He murdered uh, Amasa, who had slain Joab's brother uh, fairly in battle. And then uh, when Absalom led a coup against David, Joab executed Absalom contrary to the king's orders. Now, you, some people would argue that uh, he was proper in disobeying the king and, and getting Absalom to keep the th keep away the threat to the throne. But in any case, uh, that's going to come home to roost, I think. Because he had needlessly shed the blood of Abner and Amasa, uh, Solomon is going to order Benaiah to put him to death before we're through, all through here. Now, Abiathar is the only priest that escaped the brutal vengeance that Solomon took on the priestly order at Nob, if you recall. And uh, so after fleeing to David, he became the spiritual advisor and friend to our fugitive warrior, David. So up to this point here in, in the text here, he would remained true to, the, 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 to King David personally. But he joined the conspiracy of Adonijah, and that's going to cost him. He won't be executed, but he will be get a deserved expulsion from the priesthood before the chapter is over. So, uh, okay, but Zadok the priest. Uh, now, Zadok joined David after Saul was killed in battle, you may recall. He served David very faithfully, also served as a spy during Absalom's rebellion, if you may recall. Uh, Zadok the priest, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. And I just throwing this big thing, but these guys are cons marked here as not joining Adonijah. By Adonijah's design, uh, probably, because these are known to be loyal to David. They, they belong to David. We're not with Adonijah. But Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is by Enrogel, and called all his brethren, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. This feast that Adonijah throws for his supporters uh, is intended to try to gather others to his cause. And uh, so it calls it a sacrifice, but it really is a big, it's a big uh, public relations thing that he's pulling off here. The zone of Steleth, uh, Zoheleth, by the way, the serpent stone is the way it's translated in the RSV. It's been identified as a steepy, rocky corner that overlooks the plain where the Valley of Hinnom joins. The Valley of Hinnom and the Valley of uh, the Kidron Valley join just uh, south of Mount Zion is where they believe this is. And Rogel, which is the fountain of the, the treaders or the, the foot of the fountain, if you will, is one of two main springs in the Kidron Valley that supplied water to Jerusalem. There's two major springs. This is where they're having their big party. We're going to see another rebuttal party thrown <laughs> at Gihon, which is the, the rival spring, so to speak. There's more to it, but that's basically it, I think. And so what, what Dan and I do is try to pick all the important people, all the influentials uh, that uh, are not firmly allied with David to try to get him uh, usurp the throne before Solomon gets appointed. Obviously, the actions that Dan is doing here have been duplicated by aspiring politicians all through the centuries, in effect. But we get to verse 10. But Nathan the prophet and Benaiah 
uh, and the mighty man and Solomon's brother, he called on. Now, these are obviously guys that are conspicuous by their omission from the guest list, okay? And wherefore Nathan sp spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David, our Lord, knoweth it not? In their culture, by the way, if Nathan or David's other supporters had been invited and eaten with Adonijah, they probably would have been bound to protect them. That's a strange cultural thing there. So uh, they would, having extended the fellowship of a meal, that would put them on the spot. So in a sense, in a sense of speaking, it's almost a blessing they weren't invited because they're free to declare their allegiance. And uh, Menaniah, by the way, was the head of David's police force and uh, had distinguished himself with faithful service in the past. And of course, uh, Solomon was not invited because he was a legitimate heir to the throne and so forth. So anyway, Nathan gets right into this thing. He first appears uh, in Scripture, you may recall, to announce to David that he must defer building the temple. That was back in uh, 2 Samuel 7. And he later is the guy that reproves David for his sin to Bathsheba. Nathan is always playing a principal role all the way through this thing. He's now going to secure the kingdom uh, for David's son Solomon by exposing Adonijah's uh, manipulations here. And the way he does this is to go to Bathsheba. Uh, it's interesting that... Uh, Nathan's initiatives here are pivotal to the, to the story. Now, Bathsheba obviously still enjoys a favored position to David from the first moment that he saw her to the end of his life. Nathan is going to choose words here that are deliberately designed to shock Bathsheba. He says, uh, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah the son of Haggith doth reign? Really? Uh, and David our Lord knoweth it not. Now therefore come let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. This is not just a question of preserving God's intent of Solomon. It's, it's, it has some very practical aspects for Bathsheba herself. Because of Adonai, one of the things Adonijah will do is wipe out rivals. And so he's, Nathan's pointing out that her own life is at risk and certainly the life of her son Solomon for sure. So he says to her, Go and get thee in unto the king David, and say unto him, Didst thou not know, my lord, O king? Swear unto thy handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? And behold, while thou talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy words. In other words, what Nathan's setting up here, Bathsheba has access and influence. So he sends her in first to get David's attention. Bear in mind, he's old and he's failing here. So Bathsheba gets his attention and announces it. And while she's still doing that, Nathan will come in and confirm it. Why? Because it, the Old Testament says it'll always be confirmed by two or three witnesses. So he'll confirm it. This isn't some rumor she's heard. It's, it's something that uh, it requires attention. And he's not overstating the case. It's his initiative and forthrightness that saves the throne. By the way, David had promised Bathsheba earlier uh, that he would make Solomon king after him. This becomes clear when you get to 1 Chronicles 22 and so forth. It's obvious from the context here that David had made that promise to her in the past because she's going to recall. She's not making this up. She's help, you know, having him recall that. If the other, Her reminding this has several aspects. It's proper to bring it up. But also, it's very possible David in his old age might start getting forgetful. So she, right up front, reminds him of that pledge that he gave her. And so anyway, Bathsheba went in under the king, under the chamber, and the king was very old. And Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king, and Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, What wouldest thou? And she said unto him, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. And now behold, Adonijah reigneth. And now, my lord the king, thou knowest it not. So uh, she just she basically recounts this. It's pretty clear that David apparently is confined to his bed. That's the, that, that's the perception we have here. And she certainly treats him like a king by bowing and so forth and all that. Uh, and of course, he explained, he invites her to go ahead and tell her tale. And she goes on and says, And speaking of Adonijah, he hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance and hath called all the sons of the king and Abiathar the priest and Joab the captain of the host. But Solomon thy servant hath he not called. And thou, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise, it shall come to pass when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. And lo, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet 
also came in. Now, what's not obvious until you stand back and watch this whole story, when Nathan comes in, she apparently retreats. That's, that's the etiquette. In other words, now Nathan is the, is the big gun here, the Nathan, Nathan the prophet. He's a, he's, a, he's a heavy. And she appropriately, apparently, uh, retreats. I couldn't resist in my commentary in, in notes here, this idea that you know, she and her son Solomon are kind of defenders. You know, this is a practice that seems to be abandoned in current politics, which, of course, raises acute questions of accountability in our own system of government, but I won't get into that here. Anyway, low watch, he talked with the king, Nathan the prophet, also came in and they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? He's obviously baiting him here. For he has gone down this day, and hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called the, all the king's sons and the captains of the host, Abiathar the priest, and behold, they eat and drink before him, and they say, God save king Adonijah. But me, even me, thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaniah the son of Jehida, uh, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called? Is this thing done by my lord the king? And thou hast not showed it to thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? <laughs> well, David picked up on all of this. David the king answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. See, she apparently had absented herself, but she now comes back in. She came unto kings, the king's presence, stood before the king, and the king sware and said, get this, as the Lord liveth that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. So David's going to grab the bull by the horns, as we might say, and just nail this right now. In other words, he's not going to wait for his death. He's going to establish Solomon on the spot right here. You have to give this guy credit. You know, it's amazing how many tragedies in history occur by inaction, not moving quickly enough, not being decisive. I heard an expression many years ago that weak men hurt people. When you have a leader, there are times when it's time to act. And, and uh, we could go through recent history of presidents that didn't act decisively and result in millions killed. I stopped wearing my Naval Academy ring when Jimmy Carter was president because of, of his well-intended but uh, uh, clumsiness and, and, and indecisiveness, which caused over a million, six hundred thousand people getting, and I won't get to it. Anyway, the point is, David acts decisively here. And uh, so, and he also confirms that he had, you know, promised this to Bathsheba. And so, I'll certainly do this day, he says. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord the king live forever. And of course, those are euphemisms you're all familiar with. Live forever, of course, is, it's an expression of courtesy. And, uh, and this, this feast that's going on is going on while they're talking to him. So you can't mess around and say, I'm going to have my staff people study this thing or whatever. <laughs> it's going on down there. You, you, I, I'm not saying you can hear the roar of the crowd through the window, but it's, it's, it's not far away and it's a big to-do going on. So he, David had to act at once. And it's interesting, Nathan doesn't embarrass the king by reminding him of his promise. He says, is this what you intended or not? And of course, that David you know, nails it. He invoked the sacred name of Jehovah or Yahweh or however you want to say it. The very living God that delivered David out of all his troubles. So all debate was immediately ruled out of order. You see, the decisiveness there really impresses me. There's a time to act, and he really did. Now, as the Lord liveth, by the way, it might be interesting that that, that phrase occurs 14 times in First and Second Kings. I wouldn't make a big thing of it, but I think it's interesting. There's evidence to design all through the scriptures, but I won't beat that horse here. Now, David could not have more forcefully guaranteed what would be happening here. He did as strong as, uh, as, strong as you can imagine. Okay, from verse 32, he start, David starts giving instructions. Notice he's just starting to issue orders here. King David said, call me Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Behida. You got the priest, you got the prophet, and you got the head of the police. Okay, and They came before the king, and the king said, I'll, I'll say unto them, take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. That's the rival fountain. There's two fountains in those days that fed Jerusalem the water. And Rogo is where the other one is. They took Gihon, which is the, actually the more primary uh, place in Scripture. They're going to have their own you know, demonstration there. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there king over Israel, and blow ye with the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. Now that's uh, the, this trumpet thing is important. By the way, 
when Benaiah is in charge of the Carathites and Pelathites were like the palace guard. So it's sort of like the Praetorian in a sense, okay? Now by this, using David's personal mule was significant to the people and because it was designated as his personal mule and that, that has a profound ceremonial significance here. Now, by the way, Gihon Springs is about one half mile north and directly east of Jerusalem, just outside the city wall. And Rolo Springs is southeast of Jerusalem, not far from the city wall, where at Niger. So it's very likely that you could probably hear the roar of one feast from the other area. These places are not that far removed, if you will. Now, Zadok the priest and Nathan are the official guys here. See, there's no prophet in Adonijah's camp. Nathan is with, with Solomon here. So Nathan's presence underscores Zadok's presence as, as this is the official issue. Now the trumpets announced that uh, Solomon had legally taken the throne of his father even before his father's death is the point. I'm sure that's something Adonijah had not anticipated. Solomon commenced his rule at that moment. This official seating on the throne was, uh, to, it was perceived not just as a simple symbolic act. He says, sit upon my throne and so forth. And uh, so he was over, ruled over both Israel and Judah. When he says over Israel and over Judah, it's interesting. Either that's colored because of the subsequent events or probably already you could sense a division in the cultures. We find that phrase several times in Samuel and here. You begin to sense that when, the, when Jeroboam finally has his, his rebellion after Solomon dies, his rebellion against Rehoboam, uh, that that was probably a, a playing out of tensions that have already started here between Judah. When it says Judah, it really means Judah and Benjamin because they were sort of, and, and Simeon, they were sort of amalgamated. And, and the northern tribes, which were as a group, sometimes idiomatically mentioned as Ephraim, but it's really the whole northern group. Anyway, Benaiah, the son of Jehida, answered the king and said, Amen, the Lord God of my Lord, the king, say so too. And the Lord hath seen, uh, been with my Lord, the king, even so be he with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. Pretty exciting stuff, actually. And here's the military voice being heard. And then Zadok, so Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehida and the Cherethites and Pelethites went down and caused Solomon to ride upon King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. And Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. And they blew the trumpet and all the people said, God save King Solomon. And all the people came up after him and the people piped with pipes and rejoiced with great joy so the earth rent with the sound of them. And Adonijah and all the priests that were with him heard, <laughs> heard it as they made an end of eating. You picture this, Adonijah's guys is a rebellious group there and they're having feast. You can hear them setting down their forks so to speak and what's all that noise, you know? And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, uh-oh, he said, Wherefore is this noise of the city being in an uproar? It's getting their attention. <laughs> and while he yet spake, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came. And I, and I just said unto him, Come in, for thou art a valiant man, and bring us good tidings. And Jonathan answered and said unto Niger, Verily, our lord King David hath made Solomon king. Whoops. Uh, you, could, you know, a director of a movie can have fun with this scene. I mean, you can just, you know... <laughs> Adonijah, he's got, um, what, do you, what we usually say, egg on his face or something? Yeah. Um, and the king hath sent uh, with him Zadok, uh, oh, he's continuing now. The king hath sent with him Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet. See, you've got to realize those are the top guys. Zadok is the priest uh, and Nathan is the prophet. And Benaiah is the head of the Praetorian guard, if you will, so to speak. Uh, son of Jida, and, and he's, the, he's the son of Jida, and the Cherethites and Pelethites, those are the tribes that are, are the special guard. And they have caused him to ride upon the king's mule. You see, these are all underlining the, the official aspect of what's just happened. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king in Gihon. And they come up from thence rejoicing, so that the city rang again. This is the noise that ye have heard. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> And also Solomon sitteth on the throne of the kingdom. Now that gives Adonijah a real problem because he's now guilty of treason. Moreover, the king's servants came to bless our Lord King David, saying, God, make the name of Solomon better than thy name and make his throne greater than thy throne. And the king bowed himself upon the bed. In other words, they're extolling Solomon even above King David and King David is acknowledging it. You know, that's, that's, that's stacking the chips you know, against Adonijah. 
And also thus said the king, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which hath given one to sit on my throne this day, mine eyes even seeing it. Now, <laughs> can you picture what the party is like with Adonijah? All the guests that were with Adonijah were afraid and rose up and went every man his way. They got out of there fast, hoping that no one's taking down license plates, whatever, okay. And Adonijah feared because of Solomon and arose and went and caught hold on the horns of the altar. In other words, he headed off to the tabernacle, went into the tabernacle and grabbed, uh, uh, the altar had horns on all four corners, and that was his way of trying to find sanctuary on the theory that that might protect him. And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon. For lo, he hath caught hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me to, today that he will not slay his servant with the sword. And Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and bowed himself to King Solomon. And Solomon said unto him, Go to thine house. And that's the end of that chapter. But we've got a little more to go. So let's go to the second chapter. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself as a man. Keep charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. You may recall when Joshua takes the charge from Moses in uh, Joshua 1, verse 8. You know, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Same kind of charge that Moses gave Joshua, David is giving Solomon. And while he does that, he prospers, but tragically, in the middle of it, from his late, late his life, he goes apostate, with tragic consequences. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, thou knowest also, now he started giving some specifics here, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was upon his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. This is equivalent to saying he's got blood on his hands. And interestingly enough, he, he doesn't include, you know, the uh, Absalom thing here. He's, these other two guys, it was by deceit and inappropriate from David's point of view. So is Absalom, but that's a, sort of put in a different category. So what David says to Solomon, Do therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his hoar head go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be of, the, of those that eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom my brother. When Absalom's rebellion, you may recall when David was in flight, the, the sons of Barzillai provided him substance. And we read that, we don't realize that was critical. Uh, they needed provisions, and, and he made their flight possible. And so he says uh, he wants Solomon to give them special honors because of that, have that endure. Thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite of Bahurim, which cursed me in the, with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Menahanim. But he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death by the sword. Remember that? And I think it's very interesting because it's his descendants that yield Mordecai who saved the Jews in the days of Esther. Mordecai was a descendant of Shimei, so David's mercy there made, in a sense, echoes back when we get to the book of Esther. Contrarywise, Haman, the villain of the period of Esther, is a descendant of Agag, the king that Solomon was supposed to kill and didn't. But let's move on. Verse 9. Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his hoar head bring thou down to the grave with blood. Wow. See, David's got a problem because he promised he would not kill 
uh, Shimei, but he's telling Solomon, in effect, you got a free hand, do what's proper. And Solomon handled this in a very interesting way, we'll see in a minute. So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the days that David reigned over Israel were 40 years. Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and 30 and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. And then sat Solomon up on the throne of David, his father, and the kingdom was established greatly. And Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the son of Solomon. Here's a little incident. Now, that was a summary. Uh, uh, David gives Solomon his instructions. But now we have a little interesting incident occur here. Bathsheba is, is being uh, sort of moved into sort of what some people call a cat's paw situation. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, Comest thou peaceably? He said, Peaceably. And he said, Moreover, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And she said, Say on. He said, Thou knowest that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel set their faces on me, that I should reign. Howbeit, the kingdom is turned about and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. So he's sort of acknowledging this and yielding to it. He says, Now I ask but one petition of thee, deny me not. She said, Say on. He said, Speak, I pray thee unto Solomon, the king, for he will not uh, say thee nay, that he give me Abishag, the Shunammite, to wife. Now this sounds quite innocent. Shunammite's done her duty. David's dead now. She was the nurse. And uh, she's caught the eye of uh, Adonijah here, so he would like her to wife. But there's more to it than this because she also is regarded as a concubine, a secondary wife to David. And for him taking that is sort of a perk, if you will. In any case, uh, so it, it could be it could be dangerous. But Bathsheba isn't isn't sensitive to this apparently. She says, "Well, I will well I will speak for thee unto the king." So Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon. Now King Solomon is no fool. We're going to discover he's a pretty sharp guy. Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, and the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself under her. Now isn't that interesting? When she went to David, she bowed to David, but Solomon is it's his mother, so he's showing her deference here is that king rose up to meet her and bowed himself under her. I think that's impressive. And sat down on his throne and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. Then she said, I desire one small petition of thee. I pray thee, say me not nay. And the king said unto her, Ask on, my mother, for I will not say thee nay. And she said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah thy brother to wife. Now, King Solomon answered and said unto his mother, and why dost thou ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab the son of Zariah. These are the conspirators, remember? Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God do so to me and more also, if Adonijah have not spoken this word against his own life. Solomon doesn't mess around. The very fact that this request has been advanced through Bathsheba, he obviously realizes that Adonijah put her up to it. And that's going to cost Adonijah his life. Solomon doesn't mess around. This is not a namby-pamby. He's not a wimp. He says, Now therefore is the Lord liveth, which hath established me, and set me on the throne of David my father, and who hath made me a house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death this day. King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, the son of Jehida, and he fell upon him that he died. See, Adonijah was lucky to be alive. He should have been probably killed because of the attempt to take the throne earlier. But he was spared until this little stunt. It sounds subtle to us, but it's a clever plot. And so he's maneuvering. He's, he's playing games here. Now, see, part of, you have to get the picture. Abishag was really part of King David's harem. And so even though he had never had sexual relations with Abishag, she still had attained the, the, uh, the role of, of one of his... Uh, concubines. The idea of taking possession of a harem of a deceased king was equivalent to establishing a claim to the throne. That's developed by Kyle and others. Commentators. There's more going on here that would meet the casual reader, if you will. So see, Solomon realized that uh, the people might regard Abishag as a concubine and therefore interpret Adonai's uh, marriage to her as a claim to the throne. And uh, since Adonai was older than Solomon and uh, they might assume that he had more right to be king than Solomon. You start creating a basis of descent and uh, so on. So uh, it's amazing how often God uses a younger brother in his role. He did that with Abraham. He did it with Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and others. So he fell and died. Okay, in verse 26, And unto Abiathar the priest said the king, Get thee to Anathoth and thine own fields. 
for thou art worthy of this. Abiathar was also a priest. He wasn't the key priest like Zedek, but he was a priest. And he was uh, uh, worthy of death, as far as Psalm is concerned. For thou art worthy of death. But I will not at this time put thee to death, because thou bearest the ark of the Lord before David, thy father, uh, my father, and because thou hast been afflicted in all wherein my father was afflicted. In other words, he had years of faithful servant. So Solomon thrust out Abathar from being a priest unto the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which is spake concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. You remember way back there that um, it was it was uh, prophesied, First uh, Samuel two roughly, that uh, the house of Eli was dismissed and would eventually devolve on Zedek. And so you can go back and uh, check the chart that we had there in Second Samuel eight and those notes and so forth if you want to get into that. This little one statement here in uh, verse 27 uh, just is, is, is the chronicle, is an editorial comment to highlight so you link it up with a prophecy way back there in 1 Samuel 2 and 2 Samuel 8 and so forth. Anyway, then tidings came to Joab, for Joab had turned after Anijah. See, Joab's also one of these conspirators. And uh, so even though he hadn't turned against Absalom, he did turn after Anijah. So Joab fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. I was told King Solomon that Joab was fled in the tabernacle of the Lord, and behold, he is by the altar. And then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehida, that's the head of the, his, 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 his you know, master at arms, if you will, saying, Go fall upon him. Benaiah came to the tabernacle of the Lord and said, And thus saith the king, Come forth. And he said, Nay, but I will die here. Benaiah thought the, brought the king word again, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. And the king, and Solomon said to him, Do as he hath said, and fall upon him, and bury him, that thou mayest take away the innocent blood which Joab has shed from me and from the house of my father. And so the Lord shall return his blood upon his own head, who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and slew them with a sword, my father David not knowing thereof, to wit, Abner the son of Ner, and captain of the host of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, the captain of the host of Judah. And their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David, upon his seed, and upon his house, and upon his throne shall there be peace forever from the Lord. So Benaiah the son of Jehida went up, fell upon him, slew him, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. So that takes care of the execution of Joab. And the king put Benaiah the son of Jehida in his room over the host. And, uh, and Zedek the priest did the king put in the room of Baathar. And the king sent and called for Shimei and said unto him, Build thee a house in Jerusalem and dwell there and go not forth thence any whither. So, so Shimei is spared his life if he'll do what Solomon tells him to do. Solomon goes on and says, For it shall be that on the day thou goest out and passest over the brook Kidron, thou shalt know for certain that thou shalt surely die. Thy blood shall be upon thine own head. Now, what's going on here? The brook of Kidron is the boundary between Judah and Benjamin. He's a Benjamite. And what he's saying, if you, he's under house arrest. If you stay there, you'll be lived. But you cross that brook, you're dead meat. Because that would have political overtones, is the point. And Shimei said to the king, thy, The saying is good, as my lord the king hath said, so will thy servant do. And so Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days, like about three years. Because in verse 39, it came to pass at the end of three years, two of the servants of Shimei ran away into Achish, the, uh, the son of Amekah, the king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Behold, thy servants be in Gath. So Shimei rose, saddled his ass, and went to Gath, to Ashish, to seek his servants. And Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. Big mistake. This shows a disdain for uh, his, the authority of Solomon. And Solomon obviously had this place being watched, because it was told Solomon that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath, and was come again. And the king sent and called for Shimei, and said unto him, Did not I make thee swear by the Lord, and protested unto thee, saying, No for a certain, on the day thou goest out, and walkest abroad any whither, that thou shalt surely die, and thou didst say unto me, The word that I have said is good. Why then hast thou not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I have charged thee with? The king said, Moreover to Shimei, Thou knowest all the wickedness which thine heart is privy to, that thou didst to David my father. Therefore the Lord shall return thy wickedness upon thine own head. And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehida, which went out and fell upon him, and he died, and the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So ends the, that chapter. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we ask you, Father, to help illuminate the lessons we should have. We do pray that we too uh, will be sensitive to your heart, Father, 
and responsive to your authority. And we thank you for your word as we commit ourselves in your hands in Jesus' name. Amen.